Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this cold, dreary, still wet day. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to History is Lunch. A few notes of upcoming programs that you should all know about. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., our friends at Lemuria Books are bringing author Leif Anger to the Welty House Visitor Center to read from and sign copies of his new book, Virgil Wander. Looking forward to that, starting at 5. And then also tomorrow from 5 to 8 will be the Mississippi Museum Store's Holiday Open House. With plenty of wonderful gifts for the season, there will be food, there will be giveaways, and lots of new materials that they have uh, that they're putting out now. So come by for that. Don't forget that you, if you are a museum member, you will uh, automatically receive a 10% discount on all purchases. And of course, memberships are a great gift idea as well. Then this Saturday, members of the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians will be here to demonstrate beadwork, the game of stickball, and Native American songs and dances at the free program Choctaw Expressions, which will kick off at 11 a.m. with craftspeople inside the museum and dancing at 1 and 3 p.m. As the third Saturday, museum admission will be free all day, and the store will price all Choctaw baskets at a 20% discount. There's some beautiful Choctaw baskets over there if you have not seen them. And then the department's Christmas by Candlelight Tour will be Friday, December 7th. Um, that's a little ways off, but I wanted to make sure that everybody had that on their calendar. Sometimes it falls a little earlier in the year, in the month. And this year, these museums will be on the tour for the first time, and the model trains and town of Possum Ridge will be upstairs here instead of at the Winter Building. So where the quilt exhibit had been, those trains will be. So make plans to come and see those throughout the month of December. And, and in fact, the trains will open on December 1st, a week before the candlelight tour. Finally, with the Thanksgiving holiday on Thursday, we will not have a History's Lunch next week, but I hope you'll be able to join us in two weeks when on Wednesday, November 28th, Tony Turnbow will present Harden to Hickory, the missing chapter in Andrew Jackson's life. Today, we are delighted to welcome our former co-worker, Joe Wise, who will present Above the Trenches, Mississippians in the First Air War. Wise was born in New Orleans and grew up near Hattiesburg. He earned his bachelor's in history from Mississippi State University and his master's in history from the University of Southern Mississippi. Wise retired after almost 28 years with the Mississippi Army and Air National Guard, came to work for the state archives, and then we lost him this October to what he described as his dream job as historian with the Mississippi National Guard. I guess you can't begrudge a fellow that. Help me welcome Joe Wise. I heard the noise of an airplane. I had to go outside and look up, and I still am still that way to a degree. Um, I never did fly in my military career with the exception of um, following the course of gravity. I was a paratrooper for about 17 years, and uh, I, I could manage the controls of a, a parachute fairly well, but anything above that was uh, probably something best left to others, especially considering taxpayer dollars. <laughs> Um, but I, I was inspired by uh, the aviators of the past and I always had a fascination with military aviation uh, as a child and growing up and it did lead to my military career. I started out with the Air National Guard and uh, later transferred over to the Army side. But I was curious to see when we were researching uh, at the beginning of the centennial of the of World War I back in 2014, um, 
interest was sparked with uh, Mississippians serving there, and I've uh, received some wonderful guidance and um, help from a gentleman that I have to acknowledge today. William Jeans, a former editor of Car and Driver, was instrumental in helping me find research material for this subject. He's done a lot of research on it over the years. And um, a lot of the information that I'll present today uh, originated with his research. And there are, though he and I have looked at it, there's plenty of room for other historians to come along behind us because we have um, today presented probably about 15 or 16 pilots from Mississippi or connected to Mississippi that, that flew in the First World War. There, by number, we had guessed approximately 80 total that, that were connected to Mississippi and uh, were aviators during the First World War. And probably more research will reveal even more than that. So there's plenty of room to mine this uh, interesting topic that we have. Uh, I will start out by giving a basic overview um, how the war progressed and how the technology of aviation progressed during that time. Uh, the Wright brothers, of course, um, implemented powered flight in 1903, but there seemed to be about a decade of um, doldrum or not much activity as far as advancement in the, uh, on along those lines with powered flight until the war really accelerated advancements in technology and capability as far as airplanes went. Let's see if I can, oh, back up one, getting ahead of myself. Okay, is, um, the first use of um, air power in conflict actually predated World War I. In 1911 and 1912, the uh, Italians were trying to uh, gain colonial holdings, if you will, in Africa and in Libya, they used aircraft in a small, in a limited way against the Turks. But and not until 1914, 1918, would we really have a widespread use of air power and warfare, and really the doctrine of aerial warfare was born during that time. And of course, as I've mentioned, the airplane predated World War I. Um, but not many advancements had been made. You'll see one of the early types here is a British aircraft called the BE-2. And had a lot of uh, extra appendages down around the landing gear and so forth that they discovered later didn't need. They only added weight. Um, and there were also uh, other advancements um, that came along during the course of the war with streamlining. Um, improved bracing and the stability and actual structure of the aircraft. Um, two things that really influenced how that turned out as far as uh, driving the technological improvement was what made World War I unique as opposed to 19th century conflicts that had come before it. And two items that, um, that came out um, were actually um, the machine gun and advances in heavy artillery. Those two things caused um, a lot of changes on the battlefield and as well in, as, uh, in aviation. Um, let's see here. In 1914, when the war began, things started off rather slowly. Uh, we. Uh, the Royal Flying Corps, British Royal Flying Corps, took to France four squadrons and about 100 airplanes. And um, observation was the key role of aviation to begin with. Before that, in the 19th century and before, you had um, scouting performed by the cavalry, mounted cavalry on horses and so forth. Um, and so a lot of of the early aviators that pioneered this um, tactic of flying for the military actually came from, on the European side especially, the cavalry. Uh, many of you are familiar with Manfred von Richthofen, the German ace of aces. He uh, actually started out as a mounted cavalryman and rolled over into, the, into flying. 
He also had a means of observation that had been around in the 19th century, the aerial balloon. Um, as far as uh, courage, I've got to really hand it to the individuals that operated these aerial observation balloons. They were present at the beginning of the war and they maintained a presence on the battlefield all the way through the end in 1918. And they frequently became targets of the aircraft, the powered aircraft, because of their role. Again, I mentioned the machine gun being one driving factor, but heavy artillery being the other. These are the people that were the eyes of the artillery. And they were normally um, hoisted above on a winch system with a series of cables. And you also had a uh, sound-powered phone line that wrapped around the cable and went up to the wicker basket that the observer would be in. And he was winched up occasionally to the altitude of 3,000 feet, primarily because they had to be back a far away from, enough from the uh, front lines and, and um, enemy anti-aircraft and so forth fire uh, that they couldn't be hit out of arms range, if you will. And also, given them that from that altitude, they were able to see the, a better overview of the battlefield. And um, if they saw a particular target of interest, they would get on the phone and call the guys below and relay that information to the artillery batteries. So this made them a, especially a very uh, choice target because nobody wants to be have an eye in the sky dro dropping artillery shells down on you. Um, they did, uh, as I said, become a choice target and they knew they were because most of the people that manned these things, and to give you a, a perspective again at the altitude they were operating at, 3,000 feet, the majority of my parachute jumps that I made with the Army were at 1,500 feet, roughly half the altitude. So like I said, I, I really hand it to these guys. They had a um, metal canister that was usually attached to the wicker basket that they were in um, that already had their parachute partially deployed and stuffed up inside. They had a static line hooked to it. And at the first sign of trouble, generally they would just bail out of the basket. So they were parachute pioneers in that regard as well because this thing is filled with flammable gas. And as soon as that first series of tracer bullets start to impact on it, it's going to start to burn and you don't want to be anywhere around it. <clears throat> so that was the state of uh, aerial observation in the beginning in 1914 and we, we began to have advances. Um, again with uh, intelligence gathering they discovered that with the use of the airplane uh, they could actually start uh, instead of a person up there observing live conditions, they could gain more intelligence uh, piecing together a series of aerial photos. So the aerial photography and the, the spy plane was born basically in 1915. They were uh, started out with uh, handheld cameras and realized that in order to get a mosaic that made sense, they had to uh, paste these things together, so eventually they actually had a platform that they could mount the camera to the side of the airplane and make a more stable photography platform that way. And along about 1915, the first uh, weaponization of powered flight started because uh, occasionally you had anti-aircraft art artillery trying to um, shoot these guys down. The artillerists began to elevate their muzzles toward the sky as opposed to firing at the other troops on the ground because they realized these guys too were a potent enemy uh, that could bring doom on them if they didn't get rid of those pesky observers up there. Um, so um, they started to carry for self-protection, pistols, because occasionally if an in, another enemy observer plane happened to pass, initially they just waved at each other as fellow aviators. But following that, they soon became uh, interested in uh, aerial warfare and started taking pot shots at one another. 
the pistols graduated to the standard infantry rifle. Now, how in the world you could manage a bolt-action infantry rifle from the cockpit of one of these airplanes and actually hit anything, um, still the spirit was there. They realized that if they're ever going to actually do anything with aerial combat as far as the rifle caliber type weapons, they realized they would have to have that uh, technological advancement of the machine gun somehow brought into the air. And so they began to experiment with that. And in uh, 1915, 1916 time frame, you had a Frenchman by the name of Roland Garros that came, with a, uh, came up with a way to not only bring the machine gun aloft and, and operate it, but keep it from shooting off your own propeller. These propellers were mounted in the front, as we see here. And um, what Garros did was basically weld a, or affix a series of metal plates to the back of the prop and cause the bullets to ricochet. A good idea, but almost equally perilous <laughs> as the enemy, because you could easily do yourself in in that, in that fashion. Well, it turned out that Garros um, actually was shot down and his secret discovered by the Germans who promptly hired a gentleman, a Dutch gentleman, who had first offered his services to the British, but was turned down. His name was Anthony Falker. He came up with a, a system called interrupter gear, which allowed the machine gun to fire through the prop. You'll see that there are gaps. This is a four-bladed prop, but most were usually two-bladed. And there was a space there, which there was clear air in front of the machine gun. That interrupter gear allowed the gun to fire through the prop and it would stop it um, when the blade was in front of the muzzle. So that little invention led to the 1916 uh, advent of what was known as the Fokker Scourge. In the space of two months, 80 British aircraft were shot down by the Fokker Eindecker, which was one of the uh, first uh, versions of the aircraft designed by the same gentleman and they realized they had a problem on their hands. We've got this thing that's able to fly up behind us and shoot forward through the prop and knock us down and we don't have an answer for it. Um, the next type, so the British began to experiment throughout 1916 to come up with uh, the first uh, type of vehicle they came up with to answer that was a pusher type plane which had the propeller behind the pilot and the observer. And you could fire the observer could fire a machine gun straight ahead with no worries about hitting the prop. He just had to worry about the expended brass that came out of the machine gun flying backward and hitting the, the prop in the rear. So they <laughs> engineered a catch bag to uh, collect the brass when it came out and so forth. So there were many advances leading up to 1917. And uh, 1916 and 1917 is actually when we had our first intrepid aviators from Mississippi start to arrive on the scene. Um, so around 1917 time frame, you had more advances and in uh, aircraft stability and aircraft design, you had the Germans came up with the Albatross aircraft. Um, the British answered it with the um, SE-5 aircraft, which uh, both wound up besting the other. And then you had um, the final 1917-1918 phase where the technology had really reached its pinnacle during the war with the German D-7, which we'll discuss here shortly, and the SPAD-13. Um, These were French, British, and German designs. Uh, America with its decision to join the war in um, April of 1917, following the Lusitania and the Zimmerman telegram, which uh, threatened the alliance between Mexico and the Germans, um, basically started out with great ideas to have an aircraft industry and do great things. They began to develop aircraft of their own design, the Liberty engine, which actually did become fielded to a limited degree. But by and large, uh, American aviation industry was a little too late you know, 
too little too late, so to speak. Um, by the time the war wound down in 1918, the Americans had 704 planes in the field and uh, only 12 of those were actually U.S. manufactured. And they were based off of British design, the de Havilland Four. And they also were fielding 45 squadrons. The vast majority of those planes were French and British designs. So the American aviation industry did eventually take off, so to speak, but it was in the post-war years and into the 1920s, 30s, leading toward the Second World War. Now, back here at home in Mississippi, we had a, an American design by the, company, the Curtis Company, and we'll talk a little bit about the first airport in the state, which was Payne Field, a training facility around West Point, Mississippi. And you'll see down here in the bottom, we have several Curtis JN-4 biplanes that were used as trainers at the field. And I believe uh, my colleague Jeff mentioned last week Numerous pilots were trained here, but none, again, it was too little, too late. None actually made it into the field in Europe. However, uh, they did provide a core of U.S. aviation manpower throughout the 1920s and 30s. There is an interesting anecdotal, well, it's not anecdotal, there's documentation for it, of, uh, that showed up in the New York Times, and it's also featured in the base newspaper several copies of which are over in the archive called the Painfield Zoom. And uh, the story actually was published in the New York Times. A young lad by the name of Wardy Dawson uh, actually wrote a letter to the base commander inquiring that uh, since these wonderful airplanes flew over his house and he was greatly uh, amused by seeing them come over and fly over the house, if maybe one of those could be persuaded to land in his mother's cornfield so he could get a closer look. Wardy, uh, unfortunately, was uh, paralyzed and confined to a wheelchair. His brothers were actually serving overseas in the military at the time. And so the commander read this letter and he decided that uh, he would reply and stated that, well, we have to take into consideration um, off-site landings. Uh, we don't want to destroy any of the crops that your mother may have there for because those are more important to be used for the war effort. <laughs> but what we will do is lie over the house and we'll drop you a issue of our base newspaper, the Payne Field Zoom. And that they did. And this uh, wonderful story actually wound up in the New York Times. And that uh, is uh, one of the things that led to a, a good morale boost around West Point, Mississippi at the time. All right, let's start out. And then these are, um, as I said, we're going to cover about 15 or 16 of these guys out of the uh, probably more than 80 that were actually out there. Um, this is, uh, they're in alphabetical order with the exception of uh, Hank Stovall, who was the the crowned Mississippi ace, having been born and passed away here. Uh, Henry Cook Alain from Vicksburg and also uh, his brother are mentioned in this uh, Kosciuszko uh, newspaper item. And you'll notice that uh, the, I had a moment of uh, self-doubt here with the spelling because uh, it's actually misspelled in the newspaper article. <laughs> uh, Alain with an E in front is the correct spelling. But essentially he flew with the uh, 28th Fighter Squadron and in one of his uh, flights over the um, over enemy territory, he was hit by a single bullet and managed to stay alive long enough to bring his aircraft back to his home field. But on trying to land, he crashed and was killed. And then the family also received news that uh, his brother William had also been killed in the trenches. And so that's, that's a case with a lot of these guys. You'll see there are several sets of brothers that I was able to determine. Usually one was an aviator, one was serving on the ground or became an aviator himself. And uh, we had a lot of... Um, participation of brothers in these types of things. 
which made it doubly painful when both were killed. And we're going to talk about a gentleman that is uh, near and dear, I know, to one of our audience members' heart. I believe we have a family relative, uh, Mr. Barksdale, here with us. Hello, ma'am. Good to have you here today. Uh, correct me if I mess any of this up, please. <laughs> Hoy, okay. And yes, this uh, I did make that adjustment on the slide, but I see it didn't make it over to my permanent slides here. We, had, we have his middle name as Hoy. Okay. He um, actually started out, his um, experience was similar to a lot of these gentlemen in that they train early on to get their feet wet, if you will, in the aviation world in World War I with the British. And he flew with the 41st Squadron of the Royal Flying Corps. Um, he, um, in service with them, managed to shoot down three um, enemy fighters in the air and destroy more, I believe about five, on the ground. He did later transfer to the U.S. Flying Service and, and claimed one victory with the U.S. Flying Service. He was killed in 1926 testing a new aircraft in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, the aircraft, he was going up to test the aircraft and, and its responses to spins. And the aircraft, uh, I believe it was a Douglas O2, uh, went into a flat spin of which he was able, unable to pull out and he exited the aircraft attempted to parachute away but he could not clear the spinning airframe and his parachute snagged on some of the uh, suspension wires there and actually he fell to his desk there. Uh, a couple of years later there was a base in Shreveport, Louisiana that was being constructed and it was named in his honor and some of you may be familiar with Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport. It's where our B-52 strategic bombers and other aircraft are based over there. And I was thrilled to learn that because of, before I started doing this research, I was under the assumption that Barksdale was actually from Louisiana. But I was thrilled to find out that he was from actually Goshen Springs, Mississippi in Rankin County. I passed by Goshen Springs many a time on my way north to Choctaw County. So I always think of him when I go through Goshen Springs. Next, we have a gentleman that did not, he was not born here, uh, but he did uh, pass away in retirement in Columbus, Mississippi, and is actually buried in West Point. I discovered Wilfred Beaver as I was researching World War I aces one day and were looking at uh, some of the top scoring British aces and realized this guy is buried in West Point, Mississippi. <laughs> so I decided to do a little more digging. And um, during the um, war, he actually achieved the level of 19 aerial victories against the Germans flying. He was born in Bristol, England. He was actually flying the FE-2B Bristol fighter. Um, this particular aircraft was one of the, came about in about 1917 and it had a, an observer actually flying behind the pilot. You could do ground attack observation and it was fairly respectable in the fighter role as well. It had a single forward firing machine gun It could be supplemented on top of the wing by another machine gun and it had a rear facing gunner as well. So that probably attributed uh, a great deal to his, uh, contributed a great deal to his 19 victories. You've got guns poking out of all directions. <laughs> He actually immigrated to the United States in 1926 and became a U.S. citizen. When World War II rolled around, he re-entered the U.S. 8th Air Force and continued to serve in uh, the capacity as a liaison officer with uh, the Air Corps during World War II. And you'll see here his, uh, his list of accomplishments in the military. He became a businessman in... Uh, post-war and retired 
1962 and moved to Columbus, Mississippi. And there he passed away in 1986 and is buried in West Point. And next, um, I believe last week, again, Jeff mentioned that there was one Mississippi ace. Well, here starts our debate. Uh, depending on how you count and how you uh, determine what an ace actually is, uh, I mentioned Mr. Barksdale uh, knocked down three in the air and five on the ground, giving him a total of eight. If you count ground kills, he's definitely in our list of aces. And they were up to four of those that I've found, one being Charles Dolive. Now, Dolive doesn't normally appear in lists of Mississippi aviators. If you look on the internet, research the guy, you'll find out that he was born in Alabama in a town called Suggsville, which is roughly 35 miles to the east of Waynesboro, Mississippi, just across the border. He also, um, his parents originated, came from Bay Minette in Baldwin County, Alabama. But early in uh, Charles' life, the family moved to Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And there he graduated high school from Hattiesburg High School. He also graduated from Mississippi A&M, which later became Mississippi State University, as did numerous of these gentlemen that wound up aviators because of the engineering background, no doubt. He then um, went into the telephone industry, uh, telecommunications industry as it was in, uh, after graduating from Mississippi State and went to Memphis. There he joined the military from Memphis, Tennessee. So when you research Mr. Dolive, you'll find information starting in Alabama and then he enters from Tennessee. And then when he uh, left the military, they moved to Iowa and there he passed away. So there's no mention of either Alabama or Mississippi in a lot of the information that you find out about him on the internet. However, I decided that anybody that graduates from Hattiesburg High School in Mississippi State needs to be a Mississippian. <laughs> so I'm claiming him on my list. He was, uh, he's rather famous in the 93rd Squadron Circles because he designed their insignia that graced the side of the aircraft, that of the, uh, the warrior, Native American warrior. This is the uh, original design that he came up with in World War I on the left. The 93rd Bomb Squadron of World War II continued to use it. And the 93rd Bomb Squadron that actually flies from Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana today has that as their squadron insignia to this day. You'll see it here on the side of one of the aircraft of the 93rd Squadron. That's a SPAD 13 um, French aircraft that they were using. And again, we, we talked about uh, everyone loves to claim Dolive as their own. This is uh, from the Jackson Daily News in September 1918. Hub City Aviator wins fame abroad. But then the very next day, we had the Baldwin Times, which says native Baldwin County boy wins fame overseas. <laughs> so they're arguing back and forth over his... Uh, his origin there, and I believe that here they mentioned that his parents actually came from Bay Minette. And it was uh, instrumental in learning how to pronounce his name. Uh, the French pronunciation is Dolive, and I was like, how in the world did, did the family actually pronounce the name? And I did find out uh, by doing some research in Baldwin County, there's a Dolive Creek community there. So I thought, well, it's got to be the same thing. So we'll go with that. Next is another interesting gentleman. We had a person from England that came to Mississippi. Albert Griggs originated in Meridian, Mississippi and moved to Hobart, Tasmania, where he joined the Australian Imperial Forces in 1916. He was a civil engineer. His father was actually an administrator with the railroad in uh, Meridian, and the family had moved around quite frequently. I believe he also had ties to uh, Ohio Cincinnati area, but he, Albert was born when the family was living there in, uh, in Meridian. And he also had a brother named Walter that was born in Meridian. 
And here you'll see his um, paperwork from the Australian Imperial Forces records that state he was actually born in Meridian, Mississippi, USA. He did become a Australian citizen and joined the um, 68th Squadron of the Royal Australian Flying Corps in 1916. And later that became also known as the 2nd Squadron. There were many unit designation changes over time, but there's essentially the same outfit. You'll see a, a picture down here that's from the Australian War Memorial. That's actually uh, members of 68th Squadron. It's a little hard to see, but Albert may be included in that group of um, aviators there. Behind them is the aircraft that they flew, which was a de Havilland 5. And you'll see here at the top, it was a very interesting design. Most of the um, top wings of these biplanes were canted forward. In the case of the DH-5, it was actually canted to the rear. And um, aerodynamically, it was probably bested by a lot of the German designs. Therefore, it found a role as a ground attack aircraft. <clears throat> Albert was killed in action in 1917 and toward the end of 1917 during the Battle of Cambrai. This battle is significant because of, we've mentioned the air, airframe, the airplanes predated World War I. There was a pure invention from the war itself, and that was the tank. The, um, because the trench, the machine gun and artillery had solidified maneuver to a trench system that stretched from the Swiss border all the way to the North Sea, they were searching for a way to break out of this trench system. They were just trenches separated by what was known as no man's land, normally a shell-torn area that people didn't want to venture into too much. And they basically fired at each other back and forth or tried to take opposite trenches in the same geographic location for years. This went on um, starting around 19, the end of 1914, 1915. And then here you'll see the um, Battle of Cambrai. There's the city of Cambrai. And the British actually used the new invention of the tank to drive Germans back out of their trenches. And you'll see this dotted line represents how far they actually progressed. However, the Germans countered attack. These things were um, notorious to break down and uh, get stuck and so forth and so on. You'll see two of the vehicles here, British tanks that are actually knocked out at Cambrai and destroyed. Um, Albert received a mission one day to go on, uh, I believe it was his second mission of the day, to go and strafe strong points and bomb strong points near what is called Borlon Wood which is a forest just outside the town of Berlin, in between there and Fontaine. And this was his patrol area between those two towns. And he was struck by ground fire. The aircraft was seen to go in and explode, and his body was never recovered. So he is actually listed on the Australian War Memorial as having no known grave. Um, periodically, the Australians do a neat thing. They'll flash the name of a particular service member up on the wall of the memorial and twice a year that happens and Albert Griggs of Meridian, Mississippi appears on the wall twice a year. This is a, not to say that this is his actual aircraft, but it is a de Havilland 5 that is destroyed and in the background you'll see two knocked out British tanks on the Cambrai battlefield. So it is a crash DH-5 on the Cambrai battlefield. But there's no way to prove that that was actually Griggs aircraft. His brother followed in his footsteps and became a trained pilot. He went through uh, aircraft training and actually became a pilot. But sadly on his way to uh, go overseas, he contracted probably the worst killer of the era, and that was the Spanish flu. Young Walter died of the Spanish flu before he had uh, the ability to get his aviation career started. In 
And next we'll talk about Samuel Coy uh, of Columbus, Mississippi. He flew with the famous Hat in the Ring Squadron, the same squadron that um, had uh, Eddie Rickenbacker as one of the uh, squadron members. He was the America's Ace of Aces. And Sam managed to um, uh, rack up a four aerial victories himself in his career. And there's an interesting uh, sideline about him being from Columbus and the, the spelling of his name and the naming of bases. We've already had Barksdale Air Force Base named after Eugene Hoy Barksfield, Barksfield, Barksdale. Excuse me. <clears throat> Initially, um, there was an airfield in Columbus, Mississippi that went by the name of Columbus Army Airfield. When they were looking at naming these bases after uh, World War I aviators that had given their lives, they decided to name Colum the field in Columbus, Columbus after Sam Coy. And unfortunately, there was a problem because just a few miles down the road to the south is Meridian, Mississippi, where Key Field is located. And it was another uh, military airfield, which uh, the Air National Guard still has a, a base there. And on one too many occasions, the mail uh, was misrouted between Coy Field and Key Field. So one of the base commanders, one of the two, decided we need to rename uh, Coy Field Columbus Air Force Base. And that's what it remains to this day. <laughs> But at one time, uh, it was named in honor of, of Samuel Coy. This is a very interesting um, post-war paint jobs that were applied to what was known as the Victory Flight in, from the 94th. And in the inset there, you'll see uh, Sam's aircraft was the Easter Egg. It was a pale blue spad with uh, polka dots. and. Uh, He's not too visible in this, but I believe that's his aircraft right there in flight. But they were kind of a forerunner of uh, demonstration flyers, kind of a forerunner of the Thunderbirds, if you will, <laughs> in 1919 on a, on a short-term basis. And they did get around at Columbus Air Force Base too, naming the auditorium on base for uh, Coy, so he has not forgotten their own base. And then we come to another uh, aviator that a base is named after, Sam Keesler Jr. from Greenwood, Mississippi. Samuel uh, was a observer. He was not the pilot, but he did fly in the rear uh, cockpit section with the gun facing to the rear in the Samson observation aircraft. And again, we've already talked about how observation aircraft are choice targets of the enemy. They were on a reconnaissance mission and were basically attacked by a large uh, group of four German fighter planes. They turned and tried to uh, avoid contact with those uh, planes but could not get away. And I will actually read you a description of the ensuing action by the pilot, whose name was Riley. He describes basically what happened to him and Sam that day as they came under attack by a group of Germans led by the uh, German ace Franz Buckner. It said, four German airplanes had worked their way behind us, between us and home. Four Fokker aircraft in any position would be trouble for anyone, but from their location in the sun at much higher altitude, we had only one chance, and that was to make a run for home. But unfortunately, they didn't get away, as we can see. The tracer bullets came flying past in quick succession, and uh, they had not yet hit the motor. I took a shell in my leg, this is Riley speaking, and I could see Sam. I knew he had been hit, but he was sticking to his guns, firing every time the target came to his sights. Riley goes on to describe how the aircraft was shot up and, um, and eventually went out of control. Sam Kiesler was hit a total of six times by gunfire from the attacking aircraft. 
And when they finally crashed, the desire was to get out of the airplane and set it on fire so it couldn't be recovered. Again, they're ob an observation aircraft that has intelligence material in the camera. Uh, but they were unable to get near the aircraft because it continued to be strafed by the Germans. And Sam Kiesler was hit again a seventh time as they tried to extract him out of the air, as Riley tried to get him out of the plane and to cover. They eventually were captured by German ground troops, and Sam Kiesler passed away shortly thereafter. Oops. Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. Kiesler Air Force Base, of course, was named in his honor on the coast, so uh, that's the story of how that, that base came to be named. Um, we also have of Goport, Alexander M. Roberts. This is a little grouping that was sold at auction not too long ago, but he has a, a very interesting background. He was actually taken POW. He was another pilot that flew with the, um, the British um, in preparation of the U.S. actually establishing their own squadrons. He flew in the... Uh, a squadron, I believe it was number 74, that was shortly before his arrival, commanded by British ace Mick Manick, who was one of the top scoring British aces. Roberts, uh, as I've said, was taken prisoner, um, but he was shot down. Uh, first of all, let me back up a little bit to um, Franz Buckner, the gentleman in the former photograph. One of the reasons that he probably kept attacking Kiesler and Riley was that his brother had been killed early in the war and they said he had a spirit of bloodlust about him. He was a very angry person and in fact he only lived two years past the end of the war flying reconnaissance during one of the German revolutions that took place in 1920. Uh, contrasting to him, we have the gentleman that actually shot down Mr. Roberts, and that is uh, German ace Joseph Jacobs. You'll see his airplane there it was a, a Fokker triplane, similar to that flown by the Red Baron. He actually uh, encountered Roberts on Roberts' first mission. He got to do one turn at bat and uh, came under attack by uh, Joseph Jacobs, after Roberts had shot down a plane of his own, he made the fatal mistake of watching the enemy aircraft as it fell because he wanted to note the location where it crashed for credit. And while doing so, uh, Jacobs was actually able to come in behind him and shoot him down. And luckily, he only took a bullet through the sleeve of his jacket and uh, was taken prisoner. And you'll see uh, here, that's a photograph of him as a prisoner in Karlsruhe, Germany. Jacobs actually visited him in the prison camp and offered to uh, write a letter home to his family to let them know that he was okay. So that he was actually a, not a bad guy, um, if you will, because in the post-war era and when the Nazis came to power in 1930, Jacobs didn't like what he saw and moved to Holland and started an aircraft manufacturing industry there. When the Germans invaded Holland in 1940, he closed the factory so it wouldn't be a benefit to the Nazis and was under observation by the German secret police from then on. But he did survive the war and, and passed away, I believe, in the 70s or 80s. And then the one organization that had the largest group of Mississippians represented in it, the United States Marine Corps Day Wing of the Northern Bombing Group. This was a... Uh, group that co coordinated with the U.S. Navy to bomb submarine pens in Belgium. The U-boats uh, were sailing forth from the coastal bases there in Belgium. And this, I mentioned the 12 DH-4s that America built. I believe they were employed by these gentlemen because this is a DH-9, which is a, uh, a improvement on the four. But the uh, engine up front there, is uh, oops, let me back up one. The uh, Liberty engine supplied the DH 9s power plant, and also in uh, this group, you also had Winfield Scott Shannon of Vicksburg, Mississippi. He was able to survive the war. K 
Caleb White Taylor of Pelahatchee. Uh, this is how I found out about the squadron. I found, ran across uh, the information on Caleb White Taylor's grave there in Pelahatchee. He and John Ray Whiteside, who also flew with the squadron, both were killed in action, and they both were awarded the Navy Cross, which is uh, the next highest honor to the Congressional Medal of Honor in Navy and Marine Corps circles. This is a picture of uh, Caleb White's tombstone there in uh, the cemetery in Pelahatchee and also a photograph of him. And next we come to Grady Touchstone of Laurel, Mississippi. He has a very interesting background as well. There is a, an extensive um, collection of oral histories and other historical information pertaining to American air services in World War I called Gorell's History of the AEF. It's a 21 volume work and unfortunately it was never published because they ran out of funds in the 1920s and shut the project down. But they did manage to gain several oral histories from uh, pilots. So I was excited. I said, I've got information here in Gorell's about Grady Touchstone. I'll look him up and find out his story. Well, I get to page 300 of volume whatever, and there's one sentence. This pilot did not give us his story before he returned home. <laughs> so I thought, great. Now where am I going to find information about Grady? But luckily, uh, he was recovering in a hospital when he did return home from being a POW and was in a bed next to, at Camp Shelby, next to a, another uh, service member from Laurel, and the two began a conversation, and Touchstone related his experiences to um, this gentleman while they were in the hospital, and there, therefore we have Grady's story given down to us by the newspapers. And essentially he was shot down, uh, the aircraft was disabled when the aircraft crashed in no man's land, his jaw was broken. He probably went forward and hit the gun butt or something and it broke his jaw. I have seen um, one version that states that he spent two days trying to get his aircraft to run again. He was trying to get the engine started where he could take off and fly out of there for two days, but he was eventually overrun and taken prisoner by the Germans. He encountered an officer who was wielding a saber, and in fending off the uh, blow by the officer with the saber, he received a serious slash wound, almost amputated one of his arms. He was taken prisoner and uh, actually convalesced while he was in the prison camp. And he did make it home without giving his oral history to the AEF group. <laughs> and uh, when he returned, he actually had a great deal of fortune in post-war times. There you see a picture of uh, Mr. and Mrs. G.R. Touchstone on just coming back from their honeymoon in Hawaii. He was living in Los Angeles. After the war, I don't know if the uh, injury to his jaw had anything to do with it, but he, came, he went to dental school and became a dentist. He went to Los Angeles and became basically the dentist to the stars. He uh, had every, several Hollywood clients there in, uh, in Los Angeles. And that's where he lived for the next 30 years until he passed away in the 1960s of a heart attack. Um, very interesting story. He did fly with number one squadron, a famous British squadron. And of course, we come to the last guy in our list of uh, people here, and that's uh, Hank William Howard Stovall of Stovall, Mississippi, which is a little place up in the Delta, has its own zip code. Um, <clears throat> he was... Uh, a member of the 13th Aero Squadron and also flew the French Spad. He was uh, a very proficient fighter pilot and scored the highest score of any native being born and passing away in Mississippi, uh, Mississippian of six aerial victories. And he returned to service in the Second World War along with his son, Hank Stovall Jr., who flew with the uh, 56th Fighter Group, and uh, Jr. was shot down and killed a day after the two's reunion over Christmas in 1943. On New Year's Day, 1944, um, young Stovall was, his aircraft was shot up to the point that it was no longer flyable, and he jumped 
taking to his parachute, but he was too low and was killed when he impacted with the ground. There was some controversy after the shoot down that perhaps one of his fellow squadron mates had shot him down. There was a pilot that was convinced that friendly fire of his had actually taken young Stovall. But uh, on further and a recent research with the uh, 13th Bomb Group Association has revealed that upon uh, further examination of the gun camera footage, it turns out the pilot in question was not guilty. He was exonerated by his own gun camera footage. And it's speculated that German uh, fire is actually what knocked down young Stovall. But uh, the senior Stovall, who was present at the time, did call the young pilot in. And uh, there's no doubt he had no telling what going through his mind. The dad of the guy, I think I've just shot down, wants to see me. And he did console the young pilot and said, don't blame yourself and don't allow anyone else to blame you either. I know what this is like because I've been there. It's a very touching story. And of course, we come last, and I'll be quick with this because we only got a few minutes. Uh, the 1919 Victory Lawn Air Show, which took place not too far from here at the fairgrounds. Uh, this was widely touted as a demonstration of what combat uh, aviation would be like. And you'll see, this is Jackson Daily News, some wonderful journalistic research. Uh, famous French pad to be used in Friday's battle. That might be familiar because it's a German D7, Fokker. <laughs> so I'll just leave that where it is. Um, now the battle did, the air battle did take place, but uh, unfortunately at least one person that sent in an editorial, this was their reaction. It was a disappointment. The uh, air show lasted roughly an hour, and it was probably a realistic portrayal by combat pilots of aerial combat, because it only took place for a short time, which aerial combat does. And however, that was the main uh, gripe about this air show was it didn't last long enough. We thought they were just rehearsing, and we stood around waiting for them to come back, and they never did. <laughs> and I, I certainly hope that uh, this presentation hasn't been a disappointment to you all today. And I uh, thank you once again for coming out in this weather. Are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? <laughs> yeah, we probably have time for one or two quick ones. Why were those uh, planes so snub-nosed? They, they looked like they were just flat on the front. And, and, and why did they go to just one wing? Was it an improvement in the, uh, the power of the engines? Is that what it was? Well, they, they, uh, the reason that most of the airplanes back then had two wings was a, it was a safety precaution, if you will. You know, the right flyer had two, so let's just continue that. Uh, basically, it's there as a, it provides more lift. The uh, stubby-nosed front air uh, engines were usually rotary engines, and those were uh, very tricky to fly because the propeller would turn and the entire engine would turn with it creating a lot of torque. The, I know the stop with camel probably killed more trainees than it did people in combat. Um, but that's one of the reasons that they're shaped like that. The German Albatross that I mentioned, but I didn't have an illustration of, it was an inline engine and they were more pointy, if you will, in keeping with an uh, air, aircraft that came out during World War II. Um, the Germans actually did the Eindecker that I mentioned first with uh, Fokker's machine gun that could fire through the prop. It actually did have one wing. Eindecker in German is one single decker, single deck. So it, it, it did have one wing, but there were uh, one wing designs late in war, uh, an improvement that never really was fielded because the war came to an end before the Germans could get it out there and it did have one wing as well. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So in the case where there was a second person in the plane behind the pilot who's uh, manning the gun that went backwards, did they ever yes. shoot off their own tail? That was a, uh, a definite consideration in the design of the gun mount. Uh, a lot of times they had keeper, well, most of the time they had a keeper. Early on, they did what we would refer to as free gun, and there were incidents of them shooting themselves down. So <laughs> later designs did have a governor, if you will, a stop, 
to where the gun can only rotate so far and you actually could not bring it in line with the tail and actually shoot the fuselage. They were limited the way it would go up and down, left and right. We have actually gotten to the top of another hour. It was a great presentation. I know that Joe will be happy to answer any questions that anybody may sure have. Will. Sorry we didn't get to everybody for this. And let me remind you that we have copies of Ann Webster's wonderful book uh, on letters from Mississippians in World War I for sale over here at the uh, table. Thank you all for coming today. Help me thank Joe Wise for this, and I hope we see you back here in two weeks.